Hi there, I'm the MythKeeper. Welcome back to my channel. The best place on the internet for Pathfinder lore and history. If you like this kind of content, be sure to like and subscribe. And if there's anything you'd like me to talk about in particular, let me know in the comments below. This week we're doing another video in my faction series, and we're talking about uh, a faction that I think of as the, uh, the great enemy of the Pathfinder society, uh, the uh, uh, money-oriented Aspis Consortium, the biggest mercantile faction in the inner sea region. Uh, these guys are, are nefarious foes in most adventures, uh, and they're always up to no good, and they're gonna be a fun group to talk about. Enjoy. The history of the Aspis Consortium. The Absalom calendar begins in the year one marking the date that a then-human named Aridin raised a chunk of the Starstone, the powerful magical meteorite that once shattered the world and brought it to the surface of the inner sea. In so doing, he both raised the land of the seafloor around it and created the new island nation of Absalom, and also transcended his own mortality, becoming a new deity. As a human, he had helped the legendary general Taldaris establish the country of Taldor, and as a god, he was recognized by the Taldans as the patron deity of their burgeoning empire. Over the following 4,000 years, under the guidance of their patron deity, they fought such disparate foes as the Whispering Tyrant in the north and the Gorilla King of the Mwangi Expanse in the south. Not only did their culture and language spread with them, but so did their commercial empires. With staggering reach, the merchant princes who monopolized trade in the late years of Taldor's Golden Age became among the wealthiest men and women not just of the Inner Sea region, but of the entire world of Galarian. At the turn of the fourth millennium, however, Taldor began to levy onerous taxes across the empire to continue to fund their fruitless war with their great eastern rival, the Padishah Empire of Kalesh. At the urgings of the various merchant princes, governor aspects of Imperial Taldor's westernmost province of Cheliax consolidated a number of western armies under his control to make a bid for independence. He did this in the year 4081, in the wake of a Kadiran invasion of southern Taldor two years prior, knowing that Taldor would be unable to marshal any serious opposition so far to the west. His first act with his new armies was to destroy the Taldan phalanx at the siege of West Crown and thereafter he named West Ground the capital of a new and independent country of Cheliax. In the following years, he was able to annex the Taldan provinces of Isgur, Andoran, and Galt through a combination of force and skillful diplomacy. Governor Aspex, or rather now King Aspex, the even-tongued as he would come to be called, did all of this with the support of the wealthy merchant families who tired of the weight of Taldan taxes. Consequently, King Aspex's new nation was particularly generous to the merchant princes, whose wealth and influence suddenly grew unchecked in the new Chelish regime that owed them such a great debt. Over the following five centuries, these Chelish companies acquired enormous wealth, and the families that owned these companies soon found that they had the power and influence of kings. But this was even more so the case when the owners of this capital came together to work collectively towards some common goal or another. The greatest such alliance of wealthy merchant families was established in 4489, when three of the largest formerly Taldan mercantile families with investments in Osirian came together to inflate the value of cheap, locally made knickknacks for resale into Avistan as priceless pharaonic artifacts. The larger two of the founding mercantile families were the Adrius family and the Maldus family, both with extensive import-export businesses throughout the inner sea region, but especially along the north and south tack, and they effectively dismantled the third major investor, demonstrating the syndicate was as callous internally as it was externally. In order to protect the lies about the quality and historical significance of the artifacts they were manufacturing in Osirian, they also brought in eight additional smaller companies into the fold. Thus was established the Aspis Consortium, an unscrupulous multinational trade organization based in Ostenso Cheliax, but with interests in many parts of Galarian. The organization has weathered the social and political upheavals of the last few centuries remarkably intact. As we know, in 4606, Aridin died, and the Chelish Empire underwent a brutal and bloody civil war. The consortium used its connections to capitalize even during the bloody interregnum period to secure preferable trade deals with all of its colonies and dependencies. Even after the majority of these territories gained independence, after the chaos that followed the death of Aridin, the former Chelish colonies continued to long for the goods and fineries of their former motherland, and the Aspis Consortium was only too willing to supply them. It's critical to understand, however, that although the Aspis Consortium is headquartered in Cheliax, it predates the Thrun Ascendancy. It is emphatically not an Asmodian organization, despite Queen Abigail Thrun's best efforts to turn some of the Aspis leadership into Thrun or Asmodian loyalists. 
Her empire, and indeed her victory, has in fact been so dependent on loans from the consortium over the years that she has only limited influence over it. It is steadfastly an independent organization, loyal only to itself, with a singular goal of accumulation of profit. They are loyal to no government, having members from many countries and nationalities. This also allows them to take neutral positions in any disagreements and appeal to both sides. These tactics have allowed the Aspis Consortium to grow to be the largest and most diverse business venture in both Avistan and Garand. In fact, in many ways, the only thing that distinguishes the Aspis Consortium from other trade organizations is its scale. Their liquid assets, properties, and other holdings are valued in the hundreds of millions of gold pieces, and their willingness to do whatever is necessary to grow their profits means that their wealth and consequently their political power and influence continues to grow. For example, while opportunistic merchant groups sometimes sell weapons to both sides in a conflict, the consortium may have had a hand in starting the strife in the first place. Others might praise the consortium for providing desperately needed grain to a famine-struck region without knowing that their agents helped cause the drought that caused it in the first place. The Aspis Consortium desperately tries to cultivate the public perception that it is nothing more than a league of merchants and artisans. Indeed, many people believe the facade and see the Aspis Consortium with its black and white sailed ships as a diverse group of tradesmen and non-landed nobility with their own private army of mercenaries, hirelings and cheap labour who have no ties to any particular nation. Though this is accurate to a point, many opposing entities, the Pathfinder Society chief among them, know that profit and market dominance frequently drive the consortium to despicable acts. In fact, the intense antipathy that the Aspis Consortium and the Pathfinder Society have for each other is at this point fairly well known, and the two organizations have been at open war with each other more than once in recent history. On one occasion, the Pathfinder Society laid siege and blockaded the Aspis Consortium-controlled city of Blood Cove on the western coast of Garand for three whole months, until they were able to disrupt Aspis operations in the Kava lands that threatened to destabilize the entire region. Another example of the Aspis Consortium's unscrupulous practices, particularly in the region of Western Garand, was their active participation in the slave trade, where they sought out West Gurundi peoples, especially halflings like the Songo halflings of the Screaming Jungle and the Haza halflings of the Kava lands, but also Zenj and Bonuat humans and Ekuje elves, and sold them to the Sargavan colonialists and Chelish mainlanders for considerable profit. Fortunately, recent cultural changes propagated across the inner sea region due to the influence of the Firebrands faction have caused the Aspis Consortium to abandon participation in the slave trade altogether. Though again, it's not due to any ethical considerations on their part, but rather financially motivated as they seek to maintain a pallor of respectability. Despite being a fundamentally unethical faction, they find no shortage of hired help in their dealings. Their amorality is balanced with a well-deserved reputation for high profits and once-in-a-lifetime ventures. Of course, this is more so the case in the settled lands bordering the inner sea. The further one travels into the wild hinterlands, the more its agent's subtlety is replaced by open violence and cruelty. The Aspis Consortium's Leadership and Organizational Structure The Aspis Consortium is structured, not surprisingly, like the company that it is. However, to ensure its longevity, and that the consortium itself can outlast any individual member organizations, it boasts a robust system of redundancies, meticulously designed to prevent any single member or operation from compromising the integrity of the entire entity. At the helm of the consortium operations in the Chelish city of Ostenso are the two co-chief executives. They are broadly responsible for the entire operation. Both of these two executives are unsurprisingly the scions of the two larger founding merchant factions that established the consortium over 200 years ago. They are the consummately professional A.X. Adrius and the flamboyant Jadis Mylan Maldus IV. Chief Executive Adrius is a mastermind in public relations, carefully managing the consortium's public image by concealing its darker deeds and highlighting its more commendable services. Notably, though she is recognized internally as the scion of the Adrius mercantile family, she is not a blood descendant, as her grandfather was infertile and adopted two young children from the Mwangi expanse to continue his line. She has therefore been able to lean into her heritage as a non-Talden to advocate for the organization as a place where people of all backgrounds can succeed, often conveniently overlooking the fact that as an adopted member of the Adrius house, she inherited staggering wealth old money that dated back to the foundations of the Talden Empire. Her cool demeanor and regular meetings with influential figures in the inner sea region ensure the ongoing cooperation of power brokers and commercial interests. 
Despite sharing authority with Jadis Mylan Maldus IV, it is generally accepted within the consortium that Adrius's unwavering confidence and subtle strength make her the stronger of the two executives, allowing her to dictate the agenda, quell dissent, and attribute her few failures to high-ranking scapegoats. Chief Executive Mylan Maldus IV descends directly from the wealthiest of the consortium's original founders. Endowed with an extensive education in business management and high society, Jadis views his wealth and knowledge as an inherent birthright. Following his nepotistic ascent to executive leadership, Jadis succumbed increasingly to decadence and self-indulgent power fantasies. With AX Adrius adeptly overseeing the business, many are content to allow Jadis to revel in a playboy lifestyle. However, the playboy facade is at least partly a ruse, a foppish persona put on to allay suspicions about his even grander ambitions. Certainly those who probe too deeply into his affairs tend to mysteriously vanish. The two co-chairs work in conjunction with a body of eight shareholders, known as the patrons, each overseeing independent initiatives with varying degrees of secrecy. The patrons of the Aspis Consortium prefer to disguise the specific programs and activities they are responsible for, and few outside of their elite circle are aware of their myriad dealings. This not only gives them an advantage against their competitors, but also allows them to distance themselves from past scandals. In these instances, past indiscretions are blamed on retired patrons, and openly condemned, with the public none the wiser as to who was really responsible. The eight patrons tend to be direct scions of the first eight companies that the consortium subsumed when it began its operations, though these eight seats have shifted around considerably since the company's founding. Not all the patrons are publicly known, but some have come into the limelight in recent years. Lord Eovin Retarian is among the most infamous of the patrons, having had a direct hand in rooting out a rogue faction within the consortium some years ago. Three additional noteworthy patrons are citizens of West Crown rather than Ostenso. These three patrons living in West Crown are the tiefling Arvimus the Benighted, the cleric of Zonkuthon Muriel as Fitra, and the gnome alchemist Kara Thistle Cauldron. Directly beneath this leadership circle are a select few elite leaders tasked with coordinating the consortium's specialists worldwide. For example, the consortium's chief spy mistress, Cyril Dimina Alaspalas, is responsible for maintaining the consortium's spy network across the inner sea and beyond. Cyril Dimina employs a dozen lookalikes strategically stationed throughout her territory. This network enables her to move discreetly from Ostenso to various cities around the inner sea without ever revealing her true location. Even within the consortium, few comprehend the extent of the personal power she has quietly amassed over the years. Other such prominent figures include Fleetmaster Lord Pyro Gavhall, Head of Security Mr. Kane, and Vice Executor Professor Tantis Mace. Notably, Professor Tantis Mace also heads Conference Z, a clandestine think tank funded by the Aspis Consortium that is engaged in tasks so obscure it is unknown even to most of the Aspis Consortium leadership. It operates across the inner sea region and beyond, and engages in bizarre occult research. Like alien sciences, the study of cryptozoology and the dark tapestry, as well as trying to find the means of accomplishing mass teleportation, immortality, divine ascension, pinpoint accurate divination, and time travel. Beneath the executive layer, the consortium's official members or agents fall into three categories, gold, silver, and bronze, which denotes their rank, and they can be distinguished by the shield-like design and material of their badges. Not all agents display their Aspis badges on their person, however. Very many keep their allegiances to the organization a secret. Gold agents at the top of the rankings oversee entire regions, irrespective of national borders, ensuring smooth and profitable operations while funding new initiatives. Silver agents serve as lieutenants, managing significant operations, interpreting intelligence, and addressing local issues in smaller areas or cities. The lowest ranking full members are bronze agents, or field agents, who must make a name for themselves doing field work as individual contributors before they can ascend to the higher ranks. Even they must undergo rigorous vetting before acquiring this badge, however, as any permanent ranked member of the consortium is considered a vital part of the organization. In addition to its core members, the consortium engages numerous contractors and hirelings drawn from local populations, enticed by the organization's generous bonuses following successful operations. Constantly expanding, the Aspis Consortium explores new sources of wealth globally, with a notable concentration in the inner sea region. Ostenso serves as the Consortium's central hub, facilitating the launch, monitoring, and support of expeditions worldwide. Influential strongholds such as the Bronze House in Magnamar and the entire city of Blood Cove further solidify the Consortium's reach. 
Agents take great care to maintain the consortium's pristine reputation, ensuring that few nations actively discourage or bar its activities. Areas of operations of the ASPIS Consortium Ostenso, the corporate headquarters. The ASPIS Consortium corporate headquarters, simply called the ASPIS Building, is an impressive pyramid-roofed fortress located in the Chelish port of Ostenso. Among the most ostentatious parts of the ASPIS building is the Hall of Blades, which serves as a lavish conference room for senior executive board meetings. Thousands of swords and knives of every size and curvature hang from racks, populate glass-covered display cases, and even constitute the frameworks of a trio of deadly chandeliers. It is here that the patrons, the consortium's leaders, meet in secret to discuss the goals and operational intricacies of their organization. According to rumor, they meet once every new moon, but in truth their meetings are much more irregular and less clandestine than all that. Although some of the patrons are based in Ostenso, not all are, and so it is believed that magical means are used to convene meetings regularly. One of the most influential of the Aspis Consortium's eight patrons, Lord Eovin Retarian, is based in Ostenso and works in the corporate HQ. He is known to be extremely careful and it was his agents and work that masterminded the defeat of the Korholm Agenda, a separatist cell of the Aspis Consortium that was siphoning off money from the company to fund their own secret work. West Crown, the Vera Majestica. The Vera Majestica is the Aspis Consortium's first and oldest auction house, and much of the organization's business, recruiting, and oversight still happens in this ancient structure. Three of the eight majority shareholders or patrons of the organization are also based in this sizable building. Magnamar, the Bronze House. The ornate Bronze House is the Verician regional headquarters for the Aspis Consortium. Located in the city's working-class Dockway district, it was established in the early years after Magnamar's founding by Aspis Consortium's executive board, in the hopes that they could use this as a base of operations from which to loot many of the ancient Thessalonian ruins that dot the Verician landscape. The house's executive director is gold agent Myvir Sloan, though he oversees all Verician operations and is therefore often on the move. He also spends a good deal of time in the nearby cities of Riddleport and Corvosa. Myvir has had particular interest in acquiring businesses in wealthy Corvosa, including the popular Green Market, but has struggled to acquire a real foothold. As a result of his many travels, direct oversight of the Bronze House facility has fallen to silver agent Elise Crispin, who is responsible for all local Bronze House affairs and general Magnamar operations. Riddleport, the Weaver's Parlor. An Aspis Consortium gold agent can also be found operating in Riddleport. Her name is Lady Doriana Wida, and she runs a high-stakes casino and gambling hall known as the Weaver's Hall. She has more than one guise around the city of Corvosa, however. As a gold agent in the Aspis Consortium, she uses the Consortium's limitless wealth to expand her influence in the city and oppose the Pathfinder Society operations there. As the criminal mastermind known as the Spider, she engages in various direct criminal conspiracies, and has been known to frequently engage the Red Mantis assassins. Lady Doriana is one of the few people on Galarian who reportedly knows the true identities of the Decemvirate, the secretive ruling body of the Pathfinder Society. If this is true, then her network is very great indeed. Corvosa, the Green Market Unlike in Magnamar and Riddleport, the Aspis Consortium has only ever had tentative forays into the city-state of Corvosa. Ten years ago, it was thwarted in its acquisition of a significant market, which a Corvosan entrepreneur had established in the new South Shore district. Dubbed the Green Market by locals, it was a place where the citizenry could obtain fresh produce, clothing, and commodities essential to daily life. One could also purchase jewellery and finely crafted goods, which expanded the market's appeal even to the city's nobility. However, the market harbored a dark secret. It was constructed on the site where the city's Chelish founders buried a Shawanti Sun Clan pacifist shaman named Galdron Greenheart, a shaman who, despite his pacifistic leanings, was murdered by the Chelish invaders during the Everwar conquest. Although the Aspis Consortium greatly coveted this lucrative market, they were unable to acquire it at auction. Instead, the Pathfinder Society helped it come to the independently wealthy Ziva Foxglove of the infamous Magnamari Foxglove family. Sensing the spirits beneath the market, the Pathfinder Society had the body exhumed and moved to a dedicated shrine to put the spirit to rest. Since then, the green market has continued to be a lucrative investment for Ziva, and so in the past ten years, Ziva has had to continue to fend off Aspis' interest in the business. Malthoon, Korholm the Malthuni city of Korholm, 
the country's maritime capital and a critical port along the Encarthan trade circuit, has always had a strong Aspis Consortium presence. In 4715, a group of six different Aspis Consortium gold agents from across Malthoon came together to form the Corholm Agenda. This separatist group had gotten wind of some of the more impressive discoveries made by Conference Z and realized that they could both advance personal agendas and possibly even stage a hostile takeover of the Aspis Consortium from within using what they had learned. Unfortunately, in order to enact their plans, they had to siphon off considerable funds from the consortium, and their activities were detected by Aspis Consortium patron Eovin Retarian, who hired heroes to end their activities. Since the Corholm agenda has been dispersed, it is not known who has replaced the Aspis lords in Malthoon, but no doubt they are loyalists of Lord Retarian. The Corholm agenda storyline is played out in Season 7 of the Pathfinder Society adventure series. Druma, the Ophidian Estate on the outskirts of Curse lies the impressive Ophidian Estate. A keen consortium agent named Lord Myrosype has fostered a growing trade partnership between the consortium and several notable Callistocrats. The Ophidian Estate continues to act as the business hub of all Aspis activities in Druma. While the Aspis Consortium has yet to induct a Callistocrat into the ranks of its own organization, the two remain similarly motivated factions. Lord Myrosype continues to make profitable deals with the Callistocrats, and he makes it very difficult for the Pathfinder Society to make effective inroads into Druma. Taldor, the Grey Market The Aspis Consortium still maintains various connections back to the Old Empire, from which its hereditary scions can trace their lineage, and the impressive capital city of Opara in Taldor boasts some of the most significant regional offices of the Aspis Consortium. In addition to their recognized offices, more dubious members of the Aspis Consortium are also heavily involved in the Grey Market, an open-air square near the River Porthmos in the Grand Bridge district. The Grey Market is filled with makeshift stalls hawking wares fresh from the docks. Though the name is supposedly in reference to the morning fog that rises off the river, most people consider it a nod to the shady origin of the market's staggering array of offered goods. A number of pirates are known to favour the Grey Market as a place to unload stolen Kadiran cargo. One noteworthy such corsair is Captain Seferi of Zimar, who is also suspected of moving supplies to certain Talden political factions under the lax scrutiny of the Aspis overseers. Osirian, the Aphet Mines as we know, the Aspis Consortium got its start dealing in counterfeit Osirian artifacts, so unsurprisingly its regional headquarters in Sothis is of staggering size and opulence. However, the true wealth of the Osirian operations today come from the Aspis mining operations. In the northeast barrier wall mountains, the most profitable mines are three linked mines owned by the Aspis Consortium. Initially deemed practically worthless for over a century, the Aphet mines have experienced a resurgence under the ownership of Falsen Deek, a Chelish silver agent and a skilled earth elementalist. Deek employs a contingent of mercenaries to discourage intruders and suppress any potential rebellions. More details on the Aphet mines can be found in my Osirian deep dive video. Kadira, the Sedek offices. As it is in much of the Padishah Empire in the satrapy of Kadira, there is a long history of participation in the slave trade. The Padishah Empire was in fact founded by genie binders, who learned to draw forth and enslave the native denizens of the elemental plains and force them into performing powerful wishcraft magic. This was of course only the beginning. In order to compete with Taldor, the Padishah Empire enlisted the use of slave labor drawn from among the conquered populaces of the lands they had spread into and occupied. As it is elsewhere, in time this culture began to shift, but a few cities however remained tied to the practice. Nowhere is this more so the case than in the city of Sedek. The city, which was founded as a resort for visiting Kelishite nobles, quickly transformed into the largest slave market in Kadira. Serving the visiting elite, more than half of its residents were slaves, brought here to be trained for lives of misery among the opulent gardens and elegant plazas. The presence of the Church of Sarenray has been all but scrubbed from this decadent city, as her faithful do not approve of the Sedeki practices. Not surprisingly, though, where profit is to be made on human misery, the Aspis Consortium can be found, and the Aspis Sedek offices are not only the largest in Kadira, but also serve as the centre of Aspis operations throughout the rest of the eastern continent of Kazmarin. Now that the political tide has forced the Aspis Consortium to stay out of the slave trade, the Aspis offices of Sedek have been rapidly reinventing themselves. They are quick to point out that the Kali spice markets of Sedek offer the widest selections and the best prices on goods that often cannot be obtained anywhere else outside of Kazmarin. Jalmeray Island, Harbour Town 
As the link between the inner sea region and distant Vudra, Jalmare Island is highly valued by the Aspis Consortium as a means of extending their trade network. Here, agents of the consortium own and operate numerous businesses in the harbour town district of Prada Hanam, Jalmare's eastern facing port. Harbour town is truly the beating heart of Prada Hanam and it bustles with life. Agents of the Aspis Consortium, visitors from afar, and wayward immigrants from distant Vudra or Nagajor all intermingle here in search of prosperity. Katapesh, the Night Stalls. While the Pact Masters of Katapesh are responsible for ensuring trade runs smoothly in their country, they tend to impose as few regulations as possible on trade, making it an ideal country for Aspis Consortium affairs. Moreover, mercenaries necessary for many consortium ventures are easy to be found in the city. At least two mid-ranking agents and a number of lesser agents of the consortium work here. There are rumours that one of the infamous patrons lives in Katapesh too, although if they do, they have taken great pains to keep their identity a secret. The most prominent known ranked member is Fatima Jalabar, an Aspis gold agent and a very rich Gurundi trader. She has a controlling stake in the night stalls, one of Katapesh's most notorious marketplaces, and she is known to deal in exotic artefacts and other unusual goods. Another ranked agent of the Aspis Consortium in the city is Scorn Dahl, a man of Chelish descent who works in the Pesh trade. Kibwe. As discussed in my recent Central Mwangi deep dive video, the Aspis Consortium holds and maintains defensible sections near the western gate of the large town of Kibwe in the Mwangi expanse, and their influence extends specifically over the Brass Block neighborhood. In fact, the Aspis Consortium has purchased so much of the Brass Block that it effectively functions as a small local government there. Rahadum, the Azir offices. Visitors to Rahadum often arrive via ship at the capital city of Azir, sometimes referred to by irreverent ship captains as Port Godless, to trade for the country's fine cloth, exotic produce, and priceless gemstones. Foreigners here must submit to a thorough search by the Pure Legion, a group of specifically trained soldiers who watch for any signs of religion. Possession of such contraband carries heavy fines and potential exile, while preaching religious doctrine routinely garners imprisonment or worse. Because of the complexities of moving goods in and out of the country, the Aspis Consortium specialists have made a tidy profit here, navigating these challenges. Significant Aspis Consortium members based in Azir include the gold agent Kafar and the silver agent Nefti, who has worked as Kafar's close friend and confidant since he was just a child. Blood Cove as discussed in more detail in my Western Wangi Expanse deep dive video, the Aspis Consortium effectively runs the entirety of the Port of Blood Cove. The official headquarters of the Aspis Consortium in the Mwangi Expanse closely resembles the surrounding buildings in Blood Cove, except for the prominent display of a large Aspis snake above its entrance. Currently, Aspis operations in Blood Cove are under the leadership of Malika Fenn, a former Pathfinder who has fully embraced her role as an Aspis agent. Previously, Malika ran a Pathfinder chapter house, acting as a double agent and selling information to both the Aspis Consortium and the Pathfinder Society. As she delved deeper into the secrets of the Pathfinder Society, however, she grew disillusioned with what she perceived as the Society's hypocrisy. This ultimately led her to sell all her knowledge to the Aspis Consortium in exchange for the position of power she currently holds in Blood Cove. Among the various Aspis agents based around the Western Wangi region, one of the most notorious is Aliciette Cardoso's group The Hands of Slaughter. Aliciette is both their leader and a silver agent of the consortium. Though her family originally hailed from Andoran, they were exiled from Andoran after their involvement in a scandal involving a slaver ring was exposed. She made a name for herself with the Aspis Consortium operating out of Osirian, and then later moved to Colonial Sargava to establish the Hands of Slaughter Adventuring Party. After the Vidric Revolution, the Hands were forced to relocate to Blood Cove, where they continue to carry out nefarious missions for the consortium to this day.